feel like I'm blushing now. Uh, hi guys, thanks for coming out. This is my last uh, stop on a on a tour here, so I am tired but full of lots of warm, fuzzy feelings, and it's nice to see uh, some familiar faces in the audience too. Thanks for thanks for coming out. Um, so I'm just going to start off by doing a little reading, a few excerpts from the book, and then I will hop into some conversation with the delightful Jenny Yang, uh, who is Obama's favorite person, and uh, and then we'll uh, and then we'll open up for a few questions, and then do the whole book signing thing. If you have a book that you want to buy, like this one that you want me to sign, I'll also just sign other books, um, <laughs> in case you have other books you want me to sign. Um, so I'll just start off by reading from. Let's see. A section called Default Objectivity. In grad school, I took a literature class with a focus on colonialism. My professor, Gitanjali Shahani, was always bringing primary resources to class, often jaw-dropping early texts from the British Empire. One text in particular stood out, Board's Illustrated Guide to People, published in 1542, during the nascent days of British Empire building. At the start of the first chapter is an image of a white male in his skivvies, armed with a pair of scissors. These, the author notes, were for the Englishman to make clothing from the fabrics of the world. Included at the front was a poem describing the guide's conceit. I am an Englishman, and naked I stand here, musing in my mind what raiment I shall wear. For now I will wear this, and now I will wear that. Now I will wear I cannot tell what. All new fashions be pleasant to me. I do fear no man, all men feareth me. I overcome my adversaries by land and by sea. The idea was that being a white male subject of the British Empire offered the privilege of neutrality. You could try on the ethnicities of the world, becoming a dark-skinned Moor with great lips and knotted hair, or a light-fingered Egyptian. You could try on something else because you were a blank canvas. You could become and do whatever you pleased because, as a white man, you were invested with no other innate qualities, except, of course, supremacy over anyone who is not a white man. I was reminded of Board's guide when Justice Sonia Sotomayor was going through the Supreme Court confirmation process in 2009. She had come under fire for stating that being a woman and Latina influenced her perspective. I think the system is strengthened when judges don't assume they're impartial, she testified but rather when judges test themselves to identify when their emotions or their experiences are driving their results. Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, now the US Attorney General, agitatedly adjusted his glasses and responded, aren't you saying that you expect your background and heritage to influence your de decision making? You accept that there may be sympathies, prejudices, and opinions that legitimately, legitimately can influence a judge's decision? Sessions remarked, I reject such a view, and Americans reject such a view. I was troubled by that slippery slope between I and Americans that Sessions had traveled in a single breath. I molded over for days before I recognized why the statement had lodged itself like a splinter beneath my skin. Implicit in Sessions' reaction was a presumption that his perspective was objective and American in a way that Sotomayor's pers perspective was not. How impossible a situation. You are raised in a country where you're socialized differently, treated as other, and then chastised for acknowledging this fact. And how odd that acknowledging that human beings are not inherently objective, that their perspectives are shaped by their experiences of the world, is so objectionable to Sessions. Here, Sotomayor was articulating the real work of approaching neutrality and objectivity. She was acknowledging her experiences and examining their impact on her perspective in order to test herself. This is the same kind of work required of any human being who strives toward self-awareness and self-knowledge. Session's response perfectly encompasses white privilege. The presumption that your subjective way of being in and seeing the world constitutes a uniquely objective perspective. We cannot discuss our received notions of objectivity without recognizing that they are commonly located in this default white male perspective. What we tend to think of as objectivity is actually a very particular subjectivity run amok. And there's a little footnote here that I will read. Sessions is also a vehement opponent of affirmative action, which strikes me as a powerful irony. The reality we live in is, by default, a robust affirmative action program for white men. Like most Americans, I was raised to be a white man. 
I read William Faulkner and Ernest Hemingway. I read F. Scott Fitzgerald and Charles, Charles Bukowski. I came to identify with the emotionally disengaged characters, the staccato sentences, the irreverent dirty old man voice. The books I read asked me to imagine the power I might have. I got women pregnant and then worried that they wouldn't get an abortion, tying me down forever when all I wanted to do was continue experiencing my freedom. I wrote poems about the absurdity of writing poems, enjoying the decadence of imagining my readers drinking in my disregard for them. Being likable, explaining oneself to others, these were not prerequisites of protagonism. I watched women move, their hips in dresses, their lips on glasses, their breasts heaving, all of it offered up to me to enjoy, to consume. The fact that I was a brown woman was not something that seemed immediately relevant when I was younger. I moved through the world with the sense that I would have access to the same kind of power as the protagonists of the books I read and the movies I watched. Of course we all identify with white protagonists. They're almost always the heroes, the ones with the power to change things, to affect things rather than simply be affected. As James Baldwin put it, you go to white movies and like everybody else, you fall in love with Joan Crawford and you root for the good guys who are killing off the Indians. It comes as a great psychological collision when you realize all of these things are really metaphors for your oppression and will lead into a kind of psychological warfare in which you may perish. And whether it be because you are female, brown, queer, or in any other way visibly other from white, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual men, there's got to be a quicker way to say that, it feels like a kind of violence when you suddenly have to reckon with the differences of the body you're in. Coming of age, in particular, constitutes a jarring emergence of double consciousness, of being forced to see yourself through the eyes of others, even as you're still trying to form a sense of self. During a summer trip to Florida to visit relatives, my aunt, poolside, remarked upon my 14-year-old form in a bathing suit. When did you get breasts? How big are those things? I felt ashamed, and not just because my body was suddenly a spectacle. I already knew it was how big are those things, was precisely how I felt about the strange lumps of flesh that had sprouted from my body. They were separate from me. While I was deeply embarrassed by my aunt's commentary, there was an element of identification, of relating to her, pers her perspective. It seemed more of a farce to me that people could look at me and assume that this newly hatched female form was somehow me instead of something that had happened to me. And yet that is the presumption that the general shape you come to take imbues you with certain female traits, to be accommodating, empathetic, emotional, sexual, but not too sexual. Our bodies become shorthand for a grab bag of assumptions, some of which we grow into, some of which we bristle against. My femaleness has always been something that seemed to fit me poorly, at turns an oversized garment I could not fill, or some skimpy rag out of which I spilled. Though I've already made a mistake by calling the femaleness mine, it's never felt like a thing I owned, so much as a general shape I grew into that seemed to offer me up for public consumption. The phrase, gender is a construct, might strike some as academic claptrap, but ask any woman how they were treated before and after puberty, and you're well on your way to understanding not just the truth, but how fucked up that truth is. The extent to which the entire world and the way you must navigate it is irrevocably changed. Also at 14, I remember walking down the street with K and H, my closest friends, in the North Carolina college town where I grew up. We flinched when three men started catcalling us. Yeah, baby, look at that ass. I remember feeling bewildered and disarmed. And having a reputation as being the outspoken one, I felt vaguely responsible for doing something about it. But I did nothing. One of the most humiliating aspects of that moment was that in doing nothing, it felt like I had allowed them to do something to us. This is one of the most nefarious aspects of predatory behavior. It makes the target of the behavior feel complicit. You might be going about your business, and then someone who has more power than you demands engagement, the kind in which even your refusal does not always free you from, forcing you to play a part in a scene you had no interest in even auditioning for. A couple hours after the encounter with those men, my friends and I piled back into the car and started our drive home. That's when I spotted the men, still roving the sidewalk not far from where we'd encountered them. Wait, I told H, who was, who was driving, slow down. I rolled down the window, started shouting at them the very same things they had lobbed at us. Yeah, baby, look at that ass. 
It was a humbling and educational moment because, of course, they loved it. <laughs> I, was, I was startled in my naivete. I had turned the tables, but the tables had not turned. I didn't have the language for it then, but this was one of the first times I experienced how my words would, would always be shaped by my appearance, how they would often be heard differently, how they would weigh, often weigh less, how the expectations of my femaleness would become a thing I would repeatedly have to explain, justify, respond to, contradict. Now I'm going to read from um, a section called On Complicity. After the election, my friend T told me her story about watching the Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas hearings. In 1991, Hill testified that Clarence Thomas had sexually harassed her while he was her supervisor at the Department of Education and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She said that Thomas had asked her out repeatedly and that when she said no, he continually discussed sexual topics with her in the workplace. Watching the televised hearings, T told me, gave her a strange sense of vertigo. So much of the behavior that Hill, described, Hill was describing was what she had experienced years back when she had been working for a man who served as her mentor. He often made overtures that made her uncomfortable, turning the conversation to sexual topics, glancing at her body. But she still valued his experience and his guidance, so she found ways to live with it, minimize it. It never went too far, she said. But still, she was seeing the behavior differently in retrospect. While watching the hearings one day, she got a phone call from that same mentor. She hadn't heard from him in years. He was watching the hearings too, he said. He wanted to know whether what Thomas did to Hill was what he had done to her. This was the point at which T paused her story. She looked at me and shook her head in disbelief. You know what I did, she asked. I told him no. I told him it was fine. I reassured him. I've marched alongside T at a number of protests. I've seen her defend and advance the rights and voices of teenagers in the foster care and juvenile justice systems. As someone who is fiercely progressive and politically engaged, T struggled, as so many of us do, to understand how she could minimize her experience in that way. It's notable that 53% of white women voted for Trump, a professed sexual predator. What does it mean that these women either decided his behavior was reasonable or that they somehow thought that this personal aspect of his life was separate from his politics? Gloria Steinem, in her memoir, My Life on the Road, writes about how she tried to dissociate herself from her mother when she was younger because she saw her mother as passive, meek, having struggled with mental illness and given up a career as a journalist to raise a family. It was a stance she came to revise when she discovered, quote, that we were alike in many ways, something I either hadn't seen or couldn't admit out of fear that I would share her fate. It's a denial so many of us can relate to. We want to believe we aren't subject to the same forces that limit others' lives. We want to feel we're free to be and do anything we choose. Sometimes we become so attached to this heady narrative that we'll throw our true allies, and even ourselves, under the bus. It's frighteningly easy for so many of us in this country to empathize with those who abuse their power. After all, we, grow up, we all grow up to be straight white men until we're forced to recognize that we aren't. It's a tension evident in the fact that Time's 27 per 2017 person of the year was the silence breakers, all the women who had come forward about being sexually assaulted or harassed. The runner up for the honor, President Trump. What better evidence of how we're wrestling with what power means and where it resides? And because uh, we should close on a hopeful note, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna read from a section towards the end called Taking Back Our Narratives. I regularly teach storytelling to high school students. After a few weeks of brainstorming and practicing, they each perform a story from their lives in front of classmates and friends. It's instructive to see teenagers navigate balancing the truth of their stories with the awareness of how that truth might be received by their peers. Young one young woman that I worked with wanted to tell a story of self-acceptance, of recognizing that she was more introverted than some of her friends and making peace with that realization. An important part of her story was relating the experience of losing a friend of hers to suicide, a friend who had gone to the same school she was currently attending. During dress rehearsal, she hesitated midway through her story, right when she began to describe her close relationship with the friend she had lost. 
I thought at first it was too emotional for her and reminded her that she only needed to tell the parts of the story that she felt comfortable sharing. She bowed her head and quietly came over to talk to me. I'm afraid they won't believe me, she said, her brows knitted in concern. Well, what won't they believe, I asked. That that's what he was like, that that's what our relationship was like. She was afraid, in other words, that her narrative would not be accepted because it wouldn't be recognizable to anyone else. I told her that this was precisely the beauty of her perspective. There is no objective version. Indeed, the only reason her story existed is because it was rooted in her subjectivity and experience. This perspective was a gift, a thread that added to the memories that other people had of that same friend created a stronger tapestry, a truer representative likeness of who her friend was. There is, there is a magic to focusing less on responding to expectations. It breaks a spell, which is perhaps simply the myth that we should all fall into one or two particular categories, that our lives and stories must fit a mold in order to be legible to others. But it's the specificity of our identities and experiences that command the ears and hearts of each other. Human beings are incredible bullshit detectors, and listening to someone try to tell a story or truth that is not their own often strikes us on a gut level. Watching that young woman take the stage and tell her story was an experience that drove home how powerful we are when we fully inhabit our stories and ourselves. She was soft-spoken at the microphone, which only motivated everyone in the, in the audience to lean in, their bodies listing towards her. Apart from her voice, the silence in the room was absolute. We were all under the spell, watching her claim the role of protagonist in her own story. Like that young woman, hesitating to tell her story, we learn early on to adapt our narratives based on the people in the room. How much of myself can I share? At what point will what I share become ammunition used against me? So we soften our particularities. And as soon as we do, we give something up. Watching that young woman perform, I was reminded of the way James Baldwin struggled on the page and in real life with this question of how to push past expectations to reclaim yourself and story. In a 1961 interview, Baldwin tells Studs Terkel, all you are ever told in this country about being black is that it is a terrible, terrible thing to be. Now, in order to survive this, you have to really dig down into yourself and recreate yourself, really according to no image which yet exists in America. You have to impose, in fact, this may sound very strange, you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not with its idea of you. Part of what I've always loved about Baldwin is his ongoing commitment to complicating the conversation about the race debate. There are times where, listening to recordings of him debating folks, I've wondered at the way he seems to meander so far beyond the terms of the question at hand, yet keep you utterly transfixed. In his 1965 debate with Buckley, Baldwin is asked, is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro? Baldwin opens by reframing the terms, referring to the question as, quote, hideously loaded, and that one's reaction to that question has to depend on where you find yourself in the world, what your sense of reality is. He then pivots, saying, I have to speak as one of the people who have been most attacked by what we must now here call the Western or the Euro European system of reality. What you're watching is Baldwin repeatedly refusing the narrative in the, in the question as it's constructed. He refuses to abstract his personal experience, to strip his narrative so that it would be more objective or palatable, in line with the way Buckley would like to discuss the politics of the Negro question. He understands that there is no politics without the person, and that it was the fact of his complex selfhood that was already inherently the most political prospect on the table. Here, then, is a model for how to push back. By surfacing missing narratives that give us a history that more accurately accurately captures our power by digging more deeply into our own narratives and reclaiming the complexity of them, by no longer walking the tightrope of fulfilling expectations, by refusing the single reductive option offered us and demanding another one entirely, by acknowledging the realities of the world we're in and in, this, in the same breath, insisting that another one is not only possible, but necessary. And I'll stop there. <laughs>